Good evening. When we went to Vermont to get the story of Thunderbolt Wilson and other Yankee yarns, we came back through Barry, so I could have a look at the old number nine place where the hermit, dugout Dan, used to live. We found what was left of his underground palace, but the grand old Vermonter was gone, and no one seemed to know much about him. I'm afraid the time may soon come when there won't be such country characters to amuse the summer folks from the city. When I was a boy, there were several such characters around the part of Maine I lived in, and the hills of New Hampshire and Vermont were full of them. The one I knew best was Juddy Worcester, an eccentric old man who made periodic appearances on Main Street, usually with a bag slung over his shoulder and a small tin flute in his hands. I saw him last on a frosty day when the snow was blowing from the rooftops and Main Street was deserted. He was stirring along in front of the Baptist church, piping Yankee Doodle on his flute. I couldn't tell where his muskrat hat left off and his tousled hair began. All I could see was a pair of furtive eyes peeking from a tangle of hair and beard as he slithered along in his old felts and rubbers, around which, for added comfort and safety against the icy streets, he had wound a couple of gunny sacks. My dear old grandmother said he was a hummet, and when I asked what that was between alternate bites from a Tolman sweet apple and one of her paper-thin ginger snaps, she allowed that a hummet was a man who lived alone in a little house with a lot of cats and dogs, got his food from the neighbors, never did any work, and played on a flute. Perhaps it was not surprising then that when the Sunday school teacher asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, I shouted a hummet. I've never quite gotten over the idea. In the last 25 years, I've met a lot of hummets, or hermits if you prefer. i found most of them far more intelligent than they're supposed to be. One has to be fairly intelligent to make a living by raising whiskers, posing for pictures, and selling knickknacks to tourists. And a few of these characters are darn good businessmen. To be sure, they may live in tumble-down shacks with no conveniences, but they keep comfortable after a fashion, and they're far from lonely. If they have plenty of whiskers and a lot of tall tails, they'll never be lonesome. The fellow I'm going to tell you about tonight boasted of more than 10,000 visitors. Actually, he wasn't a hermit at all. Folks just called him that because he lived all alone in a house that he dug by the side of the road. Being a cagey Vermonter with an inventive mind, he did right well for himself. It was early in the morning during the summer of 1925 that I first met Dugout Dan of Barry, Vermont. A Boston Herald reporter and I had left Boston around 3 a.m. when it was dark and foggy. We had breakfast on the shore of Newfound Lake and arrived in Barry, ready for a long, full day of picture-making. Just outside East Barry, we came around a curve, crossed a small bridge over a rushing brook, and pulled up in front of a gasoline pump. We tooted the horn and out came a tall, rugged old man with a mass of gray hair, bushy brows, and twinkling blue eyes. He had a mustache as big as a fuller brush, and a real Vermont twang. I ain't got no gas this morning, boys, he said, but I just fried some gall darn good donuts. Won't you come in and have some and a cup of coffee? Well, just where this fellow could fry donuts was not apparent until he jerked his thumb toward a door set into the side of a grass-covered hill behind the gas pump. We followed the old fellow into a basement-like room with thick cement walls and were startled to see the trunks of two trees reaching from the cement floor to the ceiling. Between them stood a big black iron kettle filled to the brim with calling cards. More than 10,000 people have left their cards here, the old fellow said, waving a coffee pot in our direction. And I get a lot of fun winter nights a sitting here reading them. Business and calling cards from folks all over creation. How much sugar do you boys want? I take four spoonfuls myself. Coffee's kind of strong today. She's been bailing about three hours. Can't give you no cream because the milkman's late. Here, have one of my donuts. On one side of the room, there was an old-fashioned soda fountain, and above it dangled a lithographed bunch of bananas, badly fly-specked. On the opposite wall, by a door that led into the kitchen, was a baby's shirt tacked to a shingle and under it an old-fashioned slate on which had been scribbled with a piece of chalk the number 249. The coffee was strong enough to hold up a ten-penny nail, but it was hot, and while we sipped it slowly, I asked the old-timer how he happened to build his house in the side of a hill. He stretched one long, lanky leg out in front of him, stroked the ends of his mustache, and said, Well, I'll tell you how it all happened. My name's Dana Smith, and I was born in Montpelier in 1858. Folks round here call me Dugout Dan because I built my house underground. I got the idea from an old engine. Tell you how that happened. Long time ago, there was a fellow that had the rheumatiz, something awful. One day, this engine comes to his place, all tired out and hungry, and the lame fellow give him some supper and let him sleep in the barn. 
Before the engine left, he told the fella to dig himself a hole in the ground and stay in it for three whole weeks, and his rheumatiz would go away. Well, sir, he got some of the boys to dig a hole about eight feet deep in his front yard. They lowered him down in, and he sat there on a box with his back up against the dirt. In two or three days, he began to feel better. The old man passed the donuts, poured out some more coffee, and then one of the neighbors come along, peeked in the hole, and said, What you doing down in that hole, Henry? Curing my rheumatiz. Well, I got it too. Shove over. So they scooped out the dirt till the hole was big enough for the two of them, and a table, and a couple of bunks, and they was real comfortable-like. All that bothered them was the neighbors, standing round a rubbering. After a while, they put a wooden cover over the hole with a window and a curtain into it, and finally they fixed a piece of gutter pipe with a tin can on the end of it. And for fun, they hung out a sign, five cents a look. Any time they heard a nickel drop in the can, they pulled aside a curtain and thumbed the nose at the neighbors. The old man slapped his knee and laughed and laughed. I said, how'd they make out? Did they get well? They sure did. The first fella moved over to New York State and dug himself a beautiful hole in the ground. He fixed it all up, not so good as this place, of course, but he had three rooms underground, and he wrote a book about his experience. He called it Living with the Angleworms. A friend of mine sent me a copy, and that's how I happened to build this place. Finish your donut, and I'll show you around. We squeezed by the kettle of cards and went into a big underground chamber. This used to be my ice cream parlor before the flood, he explained, but it looks pretty bad now. I ain't had time to clean it up. Over in one corner, there was a small stage-like affair with a gold picture frame six feet long and half as wide, propped up in front of it. Mr. Smith brought out a big roll of dusty canvas, wiped it off, and grinned. This is something special. I don't show it to everybody, and I don't want you fellas to look till I say ready. He stood the roll of canvas against the frame and hooked one end onto a roller with a crank on it. It's kind of dusty down here, but you'll get the idea. Move your chairs up front now and get comfortable. He took off his coat, rolled up his sleeves, and said dramatically, A number of years ago, I took a trip down the Mississippi. Didn't have no camera, so when I got home, I painted a panorama of all the things I'd seen on that trip. I'm going to unroll it now with special effects. He bent over and started turning the crank. It creaked and squeaked and the dust flew out, and before our eyes there unrolled the broad Mississippi, with a couple of steamboats, paddle wheels are whizzing, and clouds of smoke belching from the stacks. Still cranking, Dan shouted, Steamboat race! The Robert E. Lee is ahead! In another moment, the boats disappeared in a mass of wrinkles, and along came a pile of jagged rocks, dead trees, stumps, and a lone hunter on horseback. Mr. Daniel Boone! And then more cranking. I don't know how many miles of the Mississippi rolled by us that morning, but there was a lot of it. And the panorama wound up with a fantastic scene in a desolate swamp where alligators of prodigious size lolled in the mud with open jaws. At this point, Dugout Dan went to town with his special effects. He snapped a switch that bathed the swampy jungle with a deep red glow. Sunset in the swamp, he shouted. Then he changed the color to deep blue. Moonlight, he whispered. Watch the moon come up as a wobbly wooden moon joggled up from behind the tree. Well, as we moved on into the next room, also underground, Dugout Dan dived into a pile of boxes and brought forth a smaller picture. Holding it close to his breast, he said with feeling, Here's the only oil painting ever made that shows all four sides of a building and the roof at the same time. It's an imaginary picture of Fort Oglethorpe, painted after a dream I had of a balloon trip that I never took. Somehow, he'd managed to get all four sides of the building into the picture. Over in another dark corner of the underground chamber, I saw what I thought at first was a submarine, but it was only a big steel boiler with pipes running in every direction. That's my heater, Dan said, and she's our Lulu. I found that old boiler outside after the Vermont flood, and I dragged her in here and fixed up a firebox and run a pipe into the brook, and does uh, she heat up? I said, what do you burn for fuel? Oh, logs, trees, billboards, anything that comes floating along. Now come on upstairs, boys, and see my second story. We climbed a flight of steps and came into the only room above ground. There were windows on all four sides, and in the middle of the room stood an enormous four-poster bed with a purple silk canopy draped from the top. Under the draperies, I saw hundreds of tropical seashells stuck onto the woodwork with shellac. And under the shells, there were alternate rows of photographs and pieces of looking glass. Dan said, Took me five years to build that bed. There's 35,000 separate pieces of bird's eye maple in it, and two bushels of seashells. I've got all my friends' pictures there, too. John L. Sullivan, Lillian Russell, and Teddy Roosevelt. And when I get tired of looking at them, I look in the mirror at myself. 
I don't sleep in it much now because it's too big, and I like my bunk downstairs because it's nearer the ground and good for my rheumatics. As we went back downstairs, I marveled that any one old man, almost crippled with lameness for many years, could single-handed build such an underground fortress against the cold and the wind. From the woods he had lugged old trees and rocks and stumps for his boiler, a pipe brought water from the nearby brook, and he'd rigged up a water wheel to provide light and power for his ice cream freezer. As we paused near the kitchen to say goodbye, I noticed for the second time the shingle with a baby shirt tacked on it and the slate underneath with the number 249. I said, Dan, you forgot to tell us why that baby shirt is nailed on that shingle. Dug out Dan fairly leaped across the room. With an almost fiendish delight, he swept his hand over the slate, rubbed out the figures 249, and with a piece of chalk wrote 250. That the baby shirt, he said with a big grin, is to make folks ask fool questions. And you're the 250th fellow to do it. I suppose thousands of you saw Dug Out Dan before he passed on to his reward several years ago. And up in Barry, Vermont, you can still see the spot where he dug the hole in the ground to cure his rheumatism and then turned it into a lunchroom and filling station. Hermits, like the covered bridges in Vermont and the windmills on Cape Cod, are fast disappearing. If you have a hermit in your town and he's an interesting character, I'd like to hear about him.